A few units ago, we introduced one way of handling possible error conditions in a system using classes and objects. Using that approach, a class's setter method would return a true or false Boolean value, and that, that Boolean value would tell us whether the, the operation we were trying to do had been successful or whether some error had happened and the operation had actually failed. On top of that, the class could provide a method, and that method could return a string, a string that basically states a rule, telling us how uh, that, that method, that setter, should be used properly. As an example, take a look at the code for these two methods in an employee object, and then we'll take a look at how you would actually use this code in a client class. So here's the first one, get hours rules. It's a pretty simple method, returns a string, takes no parameters, and that string is just a statement of the rules about hours uh, the, the number of hours an employee works must be between 1 and 60 inclusive. Easy enough. Then in the set hours method, which takes a single int, hours, as a parameter and returns true or false, if we break the rule about hours, we'll return false. Otherwise, we will successfully set an instance variable hours to the parameter hrs and will return true. True indicates that it would work. So here's an example of how we might actually make this work in some client code. Now, uh, we'd print a prompt. And in that prompt, we would state the rule. And then we'd have this sort of tricksy looking little while loop where we're saying as long as set hours returns false, and again, we're gonna pass set hours, some scanner input from the user. As long as set hours returns false, we wanna run set hours again with a new user input. Okay, this kind of error checking is actually an improvement on the kind of thing we've seen in the past. Uh, where basically our classes would just let any errors go undetected and uncorrected. We're going to talk about a more formal way of describing errors in code, error conditions in code, and how we can detect and respond to those errors. Now, before we can actually implement code for error handling, first we have to determine what the error conditions for a class actually are. We want a systematic way to do this, so basically we state those conditions in a class's interface as preconditions and postconditions. In fact, you might think of preconditions and postconditions as a sort of subject of a conversation between the user of a method and the implementer of a method. Here's sort of how that conversation goes. The implementer says, here are the things you have to guarantee to be true before you call my method. Those are its preconditions. The user of the method says, fine. And what do you guarantee will be the result if I actually call your method? And the implementer says, well, here are the things I guarantee to be true after the method finishes running. There, it's post conditions. So yeah, that's basically it. Preconditions describe what should be true before the method's call, and post conditions describe what's going to be true after it's finished running. You know, the preconditions describe the expected values of parameters and in instance variables that the method's about to use. And post conditions talk about the return value and any changes that we're going to make to instance variables. Of course, those changes would persist because they live in objects. Now, if you think of the caller doesn't actually meet the preconditions, then the method's probably not going to work properly and meet its post conditions. And that sort of makes sense. If you want sensible output, you need to give sensible input. Now, in most programming languages, we write preconditions and post conditions as comments directly above a method. You've been doing this all year. If we were to add this to the student class's method set score, just as we had seen in uh, the past lectures, we want to think of the two preconditions on, uh, on the method's parameters. Now, the first thing is that the parameter i that we pass it, that represents the position of the score. So which test score do we actually want to change in the test scores array? Well, that i has to be greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to the number of scores, right? the number of slots in the test scores array. That makes sense. The second precondition we have to meet is that the score has to be greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 100. You can't get a negative score, no matter how much you deserve it, and you can't get a score above 100. We can see the preconditions stated here pretty nicely right above the method in this header comment. And we can also see the post condition, which is just that the test score at position i has been set to score. Simple as that. If we fail either of the conditions where we're going to return false, otherwise we'll actually engage our setter and we will return true. Okay, now, not all methods have pre and post conditions. You know, something really simple like get name. Well, that all that does is it returns a student object's name. So, you know, its documentation would really just mention the return value. You don't need preconditions and postconditions for that. I know you feel this way. Writing preconditions and postconditions for every method might seem like a really tedious, frustrating task. But if you're writing code 
It means you're writing code that other people are going to read. And that means being explicit, being clear, and being thorough. That's it for today.